Are you here because you're afraid that your child is going to be a fully grown man or woman and still be using their pacifier and so you need some help with weaning? I gotcha! I'm a board certified pediatric dentist and mom of three kids ages six and under. If you missed part one, I'll link that here. I talk about thumb and pacifier habits and then what factors impact jaw and tooth position changes. But otherwise, let's get going into my best tips and tricks for helping a child wean from pacifier use. If you saw my video that led into this one, then you know that the American Academy of Pediatric Dentistry recommends that a child wean from the pacifier, from the thumb, whatever non-nutritive sucking habit that they have by their third birthday, and ideally limiting pacifier use to just rest time, sleep times beyond one year of age. As your child nears their third birthday, you just begin to have a casual conversation with them about weaning from the pacifier. Your goal is never to shame or scare them into stopping using it. You look like such a baby. I'm not sure if you've ever had a habit that you really needed to start, like eating well or stop, like eating poorly, <laughs> but it's really hard to get going on something new when you're in a routine and a rut of doing something else. So have some compassion for them that this might be a challenge for them and you're there as support and as a teammate to work through this together. The key is to help them build their own internal motivation to stop and you work as a team to make that happen. But whether your child is attached to the pacifier for more than just sleep or they just use it to fall asleep only, it's likely going to take some time and creativity either way to help them through the weaning process. Again though, the key is to work together. You don't want to scare them, to shame them, to threaten them, to punish them for for being a baby or that they're gonna have ugly teeth. But it's more to help them understand and build their motivation. And can they do that at three? Yes, absolutely. Sucking that pacifier or their thumb is something that brings them comfort. It's meeting a need and we have to find what that need is. So what exactly is it that is being met for them? What are they getting out of it? And then how do we help them meet that need in another way? So it's important to do the work of figuring out what need is being met for them. Are they tired? Are they bored? Are they scared? Are they lonely? Why are they sucking this pacifier? And then talk to them about other tactics for meeting that need. Yeah, babies, when they're sleepy, it's hard for them to fall asleep. And so they like to suck on the pacifier. But big kids, you know what they do? They actually like to snuggle their lovey or they read a book with mom and dad right before bed. They like to sing a special song and have snuggle time, whatever it is. And then you want to talk to them and come up together with tactics for meeting that need that don't involve the pacifier which can have some downsides, which you can talk to them about, like having crooked teeth or maybe sounding funny when they talk because they have a lisp or not being able to choose certain foods that they want to or breathe well through their nose. You can talk about those things. You just want to do it in a way that's not shaming. And then you come up with things together that they can do to meet that need in a better way. So like a new stuffed animal or extra snuggle time with dad or reading an extra book with mom before bed or whatever that need was, find a way to meet it together and come up with ideas together. Engaging the executive part of your brain is a great way to help a child start to just buy into this idea and understanding that they want to wean too. So here are some of the methods that I share with many of the patient families in my office that are struggling with weaning from the pacifier and they want some guidance. This one's called, oh no, my passy, it's broken. That was a reference for anyone on TikTok in 2021. If you weren't, I'm sorry, that made no sense. Oh no! This one involves breaking the pacifier. As their third birthday nears, you wanna start talking to them about how pacifiers don't work as well when you become a big kid and that their mouths are just too big because they're growing so much. And you brainstorm together ways you can help and what you can do instead for comfort if that pacifier stops working as well when they're three. And then maybe you pick out a new lovey at the store that they can hold at bedtime or you get them like a fidget spinner or something they can do. Again, whatever that need was, finding a way creatively to think about how you could meet it so that you're ready when the time comes for passy to break. You steadily dwindle down your supply of pacifiers in your house so there are only a few left for whenever they're using it, hopefully at bedtime. And then when that time arrives to wean, you poke a hole with a pin. I'll show a little video demo in the bulb of that pacifier. And then over a series of days, you make the hole bigger and bigger and bigger. Some people even get to the point of like cutting a hole, although that's pretty obvious. How's this happening? I don't know. There's a little troll that just bites pacifier holes at night. I mean, make up whatever story you kind of need to with the level of literalism or not that your child needs. But creating that hole will reduce the suction, which is going to reduce the pleasure that they get from that. And it's just not going to feel the same. I actually had a patient in my office where the mom said she did this. And the first day the toddler just walked up to her mom and was like, broke in. And then she threw it in the trash and she was done. And that was it. So it might be that simple. It might not, but it might be. But if it's not simple, it's okay if they need a lot of support. That's why you're there. And you're doing this as a team because it might be really challenging for your child. And you're doing this together. The important thing to note about this method is putting a hole in the bulb with a pacifier does compromise the integrity of the pacifier. It does not meet the Consumer Product Safety Commission standards anymore. So it's not something you would want them to have unsupervised. That means don't put a passy you've cut on or put holes in bed with them at night. It is going to be, oh no, these are broken. So it's not safe for you to have in your bed at nighttime. So it may be a little bit more challenging for a kiddo that's using these just for sleep time. And you might want to try one of these other methods. The next method is called a new friend. So you want to begin talking to your child again about the process of weaning, how you want to work together to find something new to comfort them or help them fall asleep. But then you're going to show them pictures and let them watch and learn about Build-A-Bear. 
Bear. I don't know if you've ever had the experience of Build-A-Bear with your children, but my kids loved it. We went to Great Wolf Lodge, they have their own Build-A-Bear, and you basically get to put like a little heart inside, you pick out the skin of the animal, and then you watch them stuff it up and then sew it together. It's this whole big ordeal and it is perfect for pacifier weenie because you can put those passies inside. Usually I say dwindle them down up until the day, maybe one or two of their favorite ones, and only put a couple inside, otherwise it's gonna feel kind of lumpy, not be all that soothing or comforting to replace whatever it was they were getting from that pacifier. You want them to now get it from this Build-A-Bear. It is a substitute object to give them that comfort, to help them feel calm and release some of their anxiety, whatever it was. Now they're using the Build-A-Bear for that. If that technique of going to Build-A-Bear, you're not near one, is too expensive, you can do this at home. You can go to Walmart and pick out a new stuffy and then you undo a seam and then you sew it back up after putting some pacifiers in. So this is a way to give them some comfort, but without any of the trouble that comes along with the pacifier habit. The next method is called the re-gift. And this really works better or worse depending on the temperament of your child and how interested they are in babies. So my daughter, perfect. My son, couldn't care less. Again, you want to be prepping the child weeks, if not months beforehand, kind of letting them know the importance of becoming a big kid and how there are babies that need pacifiers out there in the world that maybe don't have enough. Maybe they could help share some of their pacifiers with these babies. You can talk about how babies need help falling asleep or calming down or however your child's using it. That's what the babies need help doing and how big kids actually have other ways of doing this. So they have a new lovey, a new pair of pajamas that are really soft that they can rub or feel between their fingers. Again, find out what need was being met and then find and come up with creative different ways that they can meet that need. And then that's going to be your plan going forward. So get them involved. Ask them if they know any babies who might need pacifiers. If they don't know any, offer some up. A friend, a neighbor, a random person on Facebook that used to talk to 20 years. Look, they're having a baby and they need pacifiers. Let's go. So kids really do want to help. They have sweethearts. And if you really make a big deal out of this, this works super well. On the day that you decide to give these away to the baby, make a huge celebration. Get a poly mailer, let them decorate it, throw all the pacifiers inside, close that baby up and heck, really mail it. Go to the post office, put it in the mail, spend the 15 bucks or whatever to mail it to grandma or somebody, but make it seem really real and then celebrate that when you get home. Wow, the babies are gonna be so happy. You can even be super extra and have some babies write back, send them letters and be like, thank you for my pacifiers. These were so awesome. They changed my life. And your child will feel like such a hero and like such a big kid. This is one of my favorite methods and it really does work very well. Just requires a lot of commitment, a few extra dollars, but it's a really cute and sweet way. And it just works, I think, psychologically for them the best. That they're doing something good, they're being big and turning into a big kid, but helping the babies. And I think it works really well. And then the final method, if you need some extra help, is ask your dentist. Some dentists might be more helpful than others, but a lot of us, especially pediatric dentists, we have like mobiles with passies on them or a passy wall where kids come in and they very proudly hand us their last pacifier and we put it on the wall with a little name beside it. Something like that. Your dentist may have something like that. Or just call ahead of time and just pretend they have something like that. Can the dentist say that they have a special passy bag that they put them in that they give them away to babies or whatever? Combined methods, right? But call your dentist, see if we can help. A dentist may also be helpful in kind of teaching the child why stopping a pacifier habit might be beneficial. We want the dentist to be helpful, encouraging, not to be shaming. Some dentists out there are shaming, so don't let your dentist be involved if they're gonna be like, you're just a baby, get that out of your mouth. But if they're well-versed in child motivation and kind of internally guiding that child toward a choice that is best for their mouth, then they're gonna be encouraging and give good examples, you know, show pictures maybe of teeth that look like this or a child lisping or getting teased at school. They'll give kind of good reasoning from a scientific standpoint and from the dental standpoint of why they might wanna stop using that pacifier. And then they can also encourage and check in, maybe send a little postcard or just cheer for them at their next visit when they come to say that they stopped using their pacifier. Now, does your child still need to establish a dental home? The American Academy of Pediatric Dentistry recommends that a child have a dental home provider, a dentist that they see regularly by their first birthday or within six months of their first tooth coming in, whichever is earlier. If you're wondering what it looks like at that first dental visit and why they need to go by their first birthday, I've got you covered. I'm gonna go over that in this next video.